Hello everybody. My name is Sari Malik and this is a demonstration of the chat app I have built using the Mern Stack plus Redis. The app includes various features from user authentication to file sharing. I will pull a flowchart time to time to explain what's happening in the background when I click, type or hover on app interface. Enough of introduction, let's dive into the project. Initially, the client will search up URL for the chat app. With the React routing, he's fired to the authentication page. The routes component checks up for username and user ID from user context. Now, what is user context? User context has been employed to store and retrieve user credentials from server if not present in the front end. Later, the credentials can be extracted out from context. In user context component, a GET HTTP request is made to server on slash profile route. The server extracts cookie if present and token if present from the request. Here is the crucial part. JWT verification occurs. Well, a JWT, what it is? Elaborating JWT, which facilitates stateless authentication. It consists of three components, header, payload, and signature. Here it is, header, which contains the metadata about token, like its algorithm to sign and the token type. The token type is JWT and the algorithm is this one. There can be many different types of algorithms. The payload is the actual data in the token. In our case, that is user credentials. Well, most of the time it is user credentials. Signature is defined by developer, which is known as the secret key, which is validated. It is validated on the server to check whether the token is signed by the same server or not. Well, I too had this misconception that the signed JWT can't be decoded. The payload can be decoded by anyone as it's just base64 encoding. The purpose for JWT isn't encoding or encrypting, yeah. encrypting the data. It is to check whether it, whether it should be allowed for this data in payload to be computed on server. How is that done? By verifying with the signature. The response contains cookie and token. That token is verified with the secret key. The payload will be sent in response to frontend with a username and user ID in JSON format. User context destructures JSON object and extracts the ID and name of person, if available, to fill it in the state of person, which is an object itself with a name and ID attributes in the front end. It is maintained using use state hook. If the data, the, the payload sent to the front end is not available, the user is prompted to log in or register again. The client enters his username and password in the authentication wall and hit submit making an HTTP request to either slash login or slash register, whichever he has chosen. Well, both of them differ in methods, which are for slash login, it is slash get method and for register, it is slash post method. Well, that is self-explanatory. In real world applications, each hit on server and then to the primary database will cost a company millions. Hence, caching is done. Here too, we have employed caching with Redis and in-memory database and thus, the way in which register, which is push in caching, and login, which is the pull in caching layer, it is done. We will be emphasizing on the slash register route first, which hits on server. And upon receiving the post request through slash register route, server logic bycrypts the password using bycryption with specified salt that is used to make a key to search in the caching layer. Why by encryption? That is used to prevent rainbow table attacks. We will talk about rainbow table attacks later. The key. The key in Redis is already present. It has an expiry of a week. If the key is found, then return and prompt user to log in again. Rather than register because he is already, already present in the database. And if not found, then we will have to make the check in our primary database too, which is, the, which is the MongoDB database. Here is the crucial part. We can't be sure that if user is not present in caching layer, he won't be in database too. Well, it, uh, well, it actually resonates with a famous quote, which is the DB may still know what it is forgot. In primary database, if user is found by his username, 
it will be returned in response to login. Otherwise, it's a new, new user whom we will save in our database and the caching layer too with expiry of a week. Then after saving in database, server signs the token and returns it in response to a cookie. Similarly, for login mechanism, the user is checked with his key made up of username and bicrypted password. A similar process is followed with the same specified salt, which is 10. It was the same register too. It should be same. And hence, if the key is found in the Redis database, then well and good. And we can jump to the conclusion that the person is that a person was present in the database. So the cookie should be given in response and the token should be signed. If the person was not present in the Redis database, then he is checked again in the primary database through his username. If the user is found, check if that password he has entered and the password in the database, if those two match, if that matches, then bicrypt his password and make up the key and save him in Redis data, database layer to save it for future responses and sign the token and return it in response. If the password does not match with the one he has entered, return and prompt the user to enter the validate credentials. There is a reason why we didn't match passwords when user was present in the caching layer. Here it is, when the user was found in the caching layer, we directly jump to the conclusion that if he is present in the caching layer, the server must sign the token and return in response to the person with a cookie and let him enter into the chat app, which is directly authenticating him without checking his passwords. And that is because the username plus hashed password key, those are unique keys. If the person, hypothetically, if the person had even entered wrong password in login, the username plus the new wrong hashed password, that won't be same as the actual password plus username. And that is how the authentication worked when the person was checked in the Redis database layer through login. receiving response from server via authentication wall, the routes component will re-render itself. As the cookie is now present, the user context will receive the username and user ID in response from the server, which will set the person object into a new state to fill his ID and username. As user credentials are now available, chat component will render. Here is the pivot of chat app, the atlas of it. As a whole, the WebSocket connection is established. The TCP transmission control protocol is leveraged to elevate normal HTTP cycle into a duplex connection. Initially, handshake occurs to establish the connection into a duplex and then ping pong mechanism is used to keep the connection alive with server and the client. Upon successful handshake, a socket ID is generated and given to the user. The client behavior can be of the following categories. Switching between dark and light mode. That is through state change of the variable is dark mode, which lives in the context so that when it is toggled, every component which uses it is re-rendered. Selecting chat. When client selects the chat between him and anybody on the app, the selected user ID changes which is initially null, but as soon as a chat is selected, it is initialized with the ID of the other person. A GET request is made to the route on server, which is slash messages slash selected user ID. It is a dynamic route. Upon hitting server, all the messages of the form are retrieved, which are sent in response to client with which the UI is updated and chat history is shown. After typing something, client hits the send button, which makes a request to the server with the object containing text. Server creates a message in MongoDB and socket will trigger the event for message. And it will, it will be sent to the matching recipient IDs. 
from a collection of number of IDs which are currently connected to the sockets. After attaching a file in message, when the client hits send, the file is sent encoded in buffer of base64, which is then decoded on server and is saved in uploaded files in such server memory. A middleware is already set up to serve the static files from the uploads folder and make them accessible through the slash uploads route. As soon as the logout button is clicked, the slash logout route on server sets up a new cookie in response. It has an expiry time of 0 and on front end, the window reloads itself. When the window reloads, it again checks through the same routes component if the username and user ID are present and the person is asked to register or login again. Hence, the same authentication wall comes into action. And that's the walkthrough folks. Thanks so much for your time and attention. We covered a quite a journey today from how JWTs are generated and used to how Redis helps cache users and reduce the load on the primary database. We touched on React's component re-rendering, saw how Express and Node.js work together to power the server. And finally, how sockets plug in to bring the real-time conversations to life. I hope this gave you a solid understanding of how everything ties together and works together. Until next time, peace out.